Hello, everybody, and welcome to this session on theatre, genre and urban geography in Paris. I'm very quickly going to share my screen just for a very short introduction. So welcome to a roundtable on a 19th century Paris that is a fast changing city hosting multiple and shifting kinds of theatrical experience. This panel is intended to spotlight the less traveled boulevard of French stage music and musical spectacular. And boulevard are the operative words since they're key to our thinking. One of the keys to our thinking is the question of the radical rearrangement of the city of Paris itself. And you can see those concentric rings on the map of the fortifications, um, on the outside and then the boulevard on the inside from a map of the 1850s. So we're thinking really about the way that the city expanded um, during the um, 1840s, 50s, 60s. And key too is the idea of the Liberté des Théâtres. Um, the July 1864 legislation or deregulation which changes the nature of theatrical experience for audiences and also for composers. This means business as usual for the national and subsidized theaters and opera houses, but what we're concerned with is everybody else, um, including the cafe concert owners who push as hard as they can against their dedicated public order legislation to turn their licensed entertainment venues into something more theatrical. And of course they pull audiences with them. And so social classes and politics and the mix that this produces of musical theatrical choices is excitingly messy at this point. And these are some of the questions that we're going to be looking at. Now, we'll present three minute summaries of the position papers in roughly chronological order. And then we'll move to four five minute responses where our respondents are going to play tag and simply pass from one to the next. So we are looking to have discussion for a little under an hour. I'm really looking forward to your questions. Um, if you're following this on Zoom, then please put your questions in the chat. Um, we are planning that everybody writes their question. And if your question is um, directed to a particular person, please just let me know um, who it's intended for and I will try and bring it in to the conversation. If you're on Hoover, please um, use the uh, main um, tab that we have, not the individual papers, but the main tab that we have for the session and the Q&A, not the chat. Um, I will be looking at the Q&A tab um, and it cuts out everything else. So that will help me to see um, what I need to see. I think um, if everybody can please stay, uh, stay muted um, unless panelists are responding, then that would be that would be fantastic. Thank you very much. I hope we have a wonderful hour and a half. And I'm going to start us off by um, inviting um, Annalise Andres to um, present her three minute uh, three minute summary. She's a visiting lecturer at U Utrecht University. She's also a postdoctoral fellow at Magdalen College in Oxford. And her research explores musical and theatrical mediations of conflict in Europe during the long 19th century. She's currently writing a book on elite identity at the Paris Opera during Napoleon's reign. And her work is published or forthcoming in Cambridge Opera Journal and in the Journal of War and Culture Studies. And she's going to talk to us about Parisian hippodromes on the eve of the Second Empire. Annalise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, for that really beautiful uh, introduction. Um, so I'm going to just like briefly run through everything I said in 12 minutes. Um, I hope you will, well, join me on this ride. So in 1845, a new kind of theater was built in Paris, a hippodrome. Located just outside of the city walls, this open air structure was Paris's largest venue to date, seating up to 12,000 spectators. It offered equestrian entertainments to the city's exponentially growing population and number of visitors. 
In my paper, I discussed how the theatre interacted with the surrounding city. I characterize it as a porous space where both imagined and real theatrical practices spilled over into the city and vice versa. Firstly, I explained how its position and occupants nourished the rising Bonapartism. Situated under the Arc de Triomphe, bas reliefs of Napoleon I's victories literally overlooked the theatre. Moreover, it was a new home of the equestrian Franconi troupe, who had been popular since the early 1800s for their acrobatics and reenactments of Napoleonic and other wars. Following the 1848 revolution, the theatre was integrated into the military festival circuit, with processions spilling in and out of its space. From 1852 onward then, Napoleon III used it for reenactments of contemporary battles, such as those from the Crimean War. These elements strengthened the theater's association with governmental politics, despite myriad claims that it was, and I quote, no place for politics, end of quote, as it was subs unsubsidized and often called the theater of the people. Secondly, the open air structure allowed for imagining a more democratic form of theater, hence perhaps the attempts to dissociate it from governmental politics. On the one hand, its entertainments made no intellectual or elitist claims. With a repertoire of spectacular races and military processions, animal dressage and comic scenes, it sought to please a broad audience. On the other, some testify that because the show's sound and music could easily be heard beyond its walls, it drew a large non-paying crowd. Thus, it could still entertain the masses unable to afford a ticket. Finally, I reflected on how the Hippodrome's aeronautic stunts engendered new visions and auditions of the city. For instance, in 1858, Nadar took off in a balloon from the Hippodrome to take the first aerial photographs of Paris. Such photos showed Haussmann's geometrical reorganization of the city, but also dwarfed its monumentalism and silenced its noises. In conclusion, I argued that the Hippodrome's interactions with the city could create both a nostalgia for old Paris, associated among others with Napoleon I, and opportunities for experiencing a new Paris, a space for scientific and democratic imaginations. Thank you. Thanks very much, Annalise. I, I love this idea of, uh, of Nadar as the, as the first drone photographer. Um, it just fits with everything that we're talking about. Our second speaker is Mark Everest, um, who teaches at the University of Southampton. He served two terms as president of the Royal Musical Association. He's a corresponding member of the AMS, um, as well as co-director of the network France Musique Culture, uh, 1789 to 1918. That's the macaronic version of that particular title. His recent books are The Empire at the Opera with CUP and Genealogies of Music and Memory with OUP, both of which came out in 2021. He's currently at work on an early history of operette, and he's going to talk about opera in the bathroom. Mark, thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. That's very kind of you. Um, so my contribution to this session brings opera de salon into the discussion as a genre marked out by its physiognomy, its patterns of dissemination, and above all, its performance contexts. The performance of Opéra de Salon constitutes a counterweight, I think, to what we know about the contribution to urbanism by 19th century lyric theatres before, during and after the Haussmannian upheavals of the 1850s and 1860s. Opéra de Salon are one-act works with between two and six singing characters, and which alternate between six and nine composed numbers with spoken dialogue in the manner of the lightest forms of opéra comique, but more tellingly, of opérette. Opéra de Salon emerges in 1853 at exactly the point when Hervé and Offenbach were planning their work at the Théâtre des Folies Concertantes and Bouffe Parisien. A part of the repertory of Opéra de Salon is published in the same way as Opéra Comique, although libretti tend to be included in piano vocal scores, but a big part of the repertory was disseminated through journals aimed at female readership, with the libretto included in the text of the journal and a piano vocal score as an appendix. Opéra de Salon was cultivated by two distinct groups in two distinct geographical areas. Singers and professional musicians performed works in their own homes, 
and almost all this activity was located on the right bank of Paris in the region known as Nouvelle Athènes, which is exactly where I am right now. By contrast, those who hosted performances of Opéra de Salon, who had no claim to professional competence in music, artists, sculptors, civil servants, and a large number of medical professionals, all did so in their homes at the east end of the Faubourg Saint-Germain um, on the left bank of the city. These two geographical areas were complemented by performances given by the super rich around the Champs Elysees and those promoted at concert halls, almost all at the Salle Hertz by professional musicians. Performances at the urban spa called the Neoderme uh, were a small but intriguing subset of performances, which gives me my paper its title, Opera in the Bathroom, that pulled together medical sociability with a geographical space close to the super rich and to the cell else. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. I'm sure we'll come back to this question of spatial separation um, and uh, various forms of, of, of sonic and, and social, um, social mixing um, soon. Our third speaker is Jack uh, Blaskiewicz. He's assistant professor of music history at Wayne State University. Um, he earned his PhD in, in musicology at the Eastman School, um, where his research was supported by Fulbright and AMS 50 fellowships. His current book project explores the role of musical aesthetics in writing the urban history of Second Empire Paris, and he has uh, articles published or forthcoming in the Journal of Musicology, in Current Musicology, and in 19th Century Music. Um, and he is going to reimagine the Café Concert. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you all for being here today. If you've ever read or taught the eighth edition of the Norton History of Western Music, you may remember the cover. I have it here. Uh, Edgar Degas' 1877 Café Concert aux Ambassadeurs. If we judge the book by its cover, being that there is no book in this cover, uh, Degas' Café scene seems to frame that iteration of the text, suggesting that of all visual imagery signifying Western art music, that one sums it up best at that moment. In fact, the Café Concept receives one sentence in the Norton history folded into a subsection on lighter fare. It is of course impossible to say everything about everything in such a text and the continuing relevance of such grand narratives is up for debate, though probably not here. Instead, I took this dearth of generalist coverage as an opportunity to probe the Café Concert as a unique urban space, its structures of acoustic feeling distinct from those of the better known opera and operetta theaters. In the 1850s and 60s, Parisian café concerts were known for their porous, generic, and geographic borders, a rotating set list of songs, as well as acrobatics, stage banter, and a spatial layout that encouraged free flow of patrons between the hall, the lobby, and the street. Despite its close association with the Second Empire aesthetic of Fête Imperiale, the Café Concert was, in fact, the antithesis to the city's commercial theaters, offering a democratized social space open to all classes. Unlike the Opéra, the Café Concert was a palimpsest, wiped clean nightly of its generic and demographic traces. In my paper and the book chapter from which it is drawn, I argue that there is a close connection between the 1864 Liberté des Théâtres and Baron Haussmann's massive urbanization campaign, which targeted the Café Concert as a hindrance to the prefect's vision of a compartmentalized city plan. The Norton history has moved on from the Degas cover, just as Paris has moved on from the Café Concert, but traces remain in the form of architectural and historiographic debris which is why I'm excited about today's roundtable. I hope to talk about those porous boundaries that divide Parisian spaces and genres and how this porosity can help traverse the disciplinary chasms and hierarchies that continue to frame musicological thinking on 19th century theater. Thank you. Jack, thank you very much. Um, I, I certainly have a question about um, historical rubble um, and I'm sure I won't actually be the only one um, to do that. Last but not least, in terms of uh, our position paper speakers is Tommaso Sabatini, um, who's a Newton International Fellow at the University of Bristol, 
Um, he specializes in 19th century French theater with music, including but not limited to opera and operetta. Um, also in a European and global perspective. And his doctoral work on féerie, the French fairy plays have been supported by the French government and the American Musicological Society. And he's going to talk about féerie, updated and upscaled. Thank you. So uh, in my paper, I'm looking, uh, unsurprisingly at this point, at uh, Parisian féerie in the uh, last third of the 19th century. So for those unfamiliar, which I guess is most people, uh, Ferry was the fairy play. Uh, and despite its complete erasure from uh, historiographies of music, it uh, contained a lot of music in the form of uh, melodramatic orchestra cues, uh, vocal numbers, and dance. The 1860s saw so three interlocking transformations in the infrastructure of Parisian theater. Uh, namely Osman's uh, urban renovations, the uh, abolition of the licensing system, um, which is the, the so-called Liberté de Théâtre, um, Catherine has talked about, and uh, the switch to a new business model, uh, which Christophe Charles has called a new regime of production with fewer, more expensive productions, longer runs, and a higher proportion of revivals. So I argue that uh, these transformations in the infrastructure affect the artistic output, and that theory is a privileged vantage point to observe this evolution, as it was an unapologetically commercial genre, and as such had a particularly unmediated uh, relationship to the infrastructure. The Liberté de Théâtre opened up the possibility for Ferry to have a sizable amount of original music or even a complete original score by a single composer, which is what I call composerly Ferry. The former came to fruition with the 1865 production of uh, La Biche Bois uh, with new music by Hervé. The latter uh, with the four Ferry uh, Offenbach wrote for the Gaité in the 1870s. All these Ferry productions uh, followed the logic of the new regime of production. And I think that in, um, in Offenbach, uh, at the Gaité, we can see a case of gentrification induced by the Osman of renovation. Offenbach managed to market mainstream ferry to a geographically broader, uh, though uh, socially a narrower audience. Uh, Gaston Serpet, in his Composer Ferry of the 1880s and 1890s, carves out a niche for a more exclusive brand of adult themed ferry. I think this reflects the fact that in the meanwhile, opera style music had become depreciated by its dominance in the Parisian theatrical landscape and could no longer serve as a marker of a social and cultural status on its own. And despite my title listing three composers, I lesson from the history of Ferry um, uh, from the 1860s onwards, onwards seems to be that original music was valued not so much qua original as qua new, and that uh, the generic identity of Ferry was apparently relatively indifferent to the presence or absence of original music, uh, both things that uh, I, I believe are at odds with our usual assumptions as musicologists. Tomasa, thank you very much, and reflections on what we do. Um, that's a very nice way to, to end, I think, um, our quartet, our first quartet. Um, we're going to follow with a second quartet. Um, we asked our respondents not to respond individually to particular papers, but to take the entire um, quartet of papers in, in the round. Um, so we, our four respondents are going to speak in, in this order. Um, first, we're going to hear from Sarah Hibbard, who's Stanley Hugh Baydock Chair of Music at the University of Bristol and a specialist on French Grand Opera, a book on French Grand Opera and the Historical Imagination, and currently finishing up a project on the revolutionary sublime in French opera. Um, she's going to be followed by Céline Frigomanning, who is a full professor in Italian studies at the University de Lyon 3 in France, um, a member of the Institut Universitaire de France, um, and she has been uh, working particularly on singers at the Théâtre Italien, and um, is also very interested in preparing a book on music, hip not music hypnosis medicine in the 19th century, um, which is coming out. Uh, later on this year. 
Um, thirdly, we're going to hear from Annegret Fauser, who's uh, Kerry C. Um, Bossema Distinguished Professor of Music and Adjunct Professor of Women and Gender Studies at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, with research focusing on music of the 19th and 20th centuries, both France and the USA. And she's going to be followed by Claire Rowden, a reader in musicology at Cardiff University, um, with recent work on opera and parody in France, and some of that will come out in her response, um, and co-editing with uh, Richard Langham Smith of Carmen Abroad. So I'm going to turn over to um, Sarah to start off this relay race, and each person is going to hand over to the next. Thank you, Sarah. Great. Thanks, Catherine. Hello, everyone. Um, reading these four very rich papers, it struck me that each presents a theatrical genre as a microcosm. So for Annalise, historical spectacles at the Hippodrome in the late 1840s captured highlights from France's heroic past enacting battles and tournaments in order to project its image as a military power into the future. For Mark, the technologies of power exercised by the state in the institutions of 19th century French opera were replicated in domestic spaces in the 1850s and 60s as wealthy aristocrats, bankers and industrialists mounted their own opéra de salon. Jack presents the café concert of the 1860s and 70s as a cultural palimpsest that resisted containment, proletariat and bourgeois mingled in spaces of porous socialization. Finally, Tommaso offers the ferry as a poster child for transformations in the theater industry. In short, these papers offer microcosms of French history, political power structures, Parisian society, and the theater industry that can be understood against the transformations of the second half of the 19th century that we've been hearing about already, as monarchy gave way to empire, to republic, as theatres were deregulated, as housemanization and the annexing of the banlieue changed the physical space and social makeup of the city. Impulses for control and freedom, repression and escape were brought into new relationships that impacted on theatre in complex ways. We might view these theatrical microcosms as heterotopias, Michel Foucault's term for worlds within worlds that both mirror and contest across time and space. Indeed, a heterotopia can be understood as a space for the affirmation of difference and a means of escape. So what are the implications of such a conception for us? At a basic level, these theatrical microcosms present different perspectives that throw light back onto the center, opera situated in the wealthy heart of the city, perhaps. For example, for Tommaso, the pervasiveness and sophistication of visual spectacle beyond the opera house and beyond the Grand Boulevard. Or for Marc, the impossibility of separating private from public political relationships. Or for Annalise, the appetite for historical reenactment and collapsing of time. In other words, these theatrical worlds offer deeper context for our understanding of ca canonic opera. But these microcosms can also disrupt the center periphery hierarchy and the radial view of the city. Thus, Tommaso's understanding of Ferry as an all pervasive force suggests a reconceptualization of theater geography, history, and audiences downplaying institutions and genres and indeed premieres allows for a more fluid understanding of theatrical practice and relationships, a foregrounding of the ephemeral and a questioning of traditional systems of value. Porosity figures explicitly or implicitly in all of the papers as a positive force, the openness of borders between spaces, genres, social classes, performer, spectator. Though, as Jack reminds us, like theatre de deregulation or housemanization, such apparent freedom can quickly lead to the opposite. More intimate spaces of theatrical socialization and genre have disappeared from maps of Paris and histories of opera and effectively been erased from the record. Perhaps it is our centrifugal tendencies as music historians, our compulsion to seek out the neglected and unusual the quirky, our political sympathies with the fringe, perhaps, 
that bring such intimacies back into focus and thereby help to rejuvenate the push-pull with the centre. For Foucault, the ship is the supreme, the supreme heterotopia. A society without ships is an inherently repressive one. These theatrical microcosms float both within and without opera history as spaces of possibility. Thank you. Over to Celine. Thank you, Sarah. And hello, everybody. Bonjour à, à toutes et à tous. Bonsoir. <laughs> My response will focus on one central issue. Is the question of connections between genre and geography in 19th century theatrical Paris a dialectical one? Suspending between binary terms, centralization, decentralization, institutions, extra institutional structures, authority, subordination, porosity versus impermeability. Are we, in the words of anthropologist Eduard Vivel di Castro, to make small multiplicities proliferate against the great dividers? In this perspective, it is not a question of erasing the contours, but of folding and thickening them. Sarah suggested a thought experiment. Let's imagine another one. What if these places were not ships, but small secret islands, partly hidden by the bigger ones? Some are connected, others isolated. It is an archipelago which allows for occasional crossings. In setting foot on such islands, these papers question not only spectators' mobility across social boundaries, genres, and the city itself. They interrogate the extent to which such mobility itself is fleeting. All these spectators counterbalancing conflicting dynamics. Jack reminded us how Osman's vision was rooted in principles of symmetry and monumentalism. It was also hygienist. Paris was a body to be sanitized. The central body was a priority, while other parts were protruding towards the east. A body is a bundle of affects and capacities generating multiple perspectives beyond our common, possibly chronocentric dialectics. But how are we to examine, to examine spectators' versatile body while posing in salon, stuck in crowds in the hippodromes, or altered by drink in the cafe concert? Perhaps not by asking how they see the word, but rather which word they see. This would not be an effort to see things their way, an approach both suggested by historian Quentin Skinner and recognized as utopian, but a perspectival relation to the spectators of the time. Well, there is then a ghostly presence which haunts all of these islands. Here, all classes mingle, we read in L'Hippodrome Illustré. Politics has no place here. In contrast, analyst shows how political the hippodrome performances were. And indeed, historians can consider the task as an unveiling of past realities, an act of contradiction sometimes of what the sources say. But we are in 1847, so one year before the Republican Revolution, intensely inspired by 1789, of course, by its moralized principles of fraternity and egalitarism. Men on horseback confuse Bonapartist and revolutionary nostalgia. The performance, both popular and reactionary, evokes the reenactment of battles, but also the Fête de la Fraternité and animal shows promoted by the First Republic from 1792 on. The revolutionary ghost also frequented the Café Concert. Jack demonstrated that the Liberté des Théâtres was an assault on the autonomy of the Café Cons. Eluding dialectics, we might also connect the Café Concert to the revolutionary and then Republican Société Chantante. Both promoted songs which could sound Republican or Imperial, depending on the occasion, or precisely on the same occasion. Think, for instance, of the French songs of the 1859 campaign against Austria in North Italy. We also feel our gas vibrating through Tommaso's paper as the ferry was born from revolutionary experimentations. And we sense its presence in the sites explored by Mark, whose forms of sociability owe a great deal to the Lumière and revolutionary circles, chosen societies united by selective affinities. 
These papers thus open up perspectives on what 19th century musical Paris was, but also on what it was not. Nouvelle Athènes, Neotherme, these sites evoke places which don't exist. Imagine places ideally ruled political and social systems. Imaginary islands in the city as 19th century theater was also deeply a theater of utopia. And I pass now to Anne Brett for her words. Merci Celine, uh, hello everyone. So I was struck by the glimpses of, or perhaps better, the imaginary eavesdropping onto sonic practices offered by these four papers as they took us on a historic sound walk through Haussmann's Paris. They have pointed to the entanglements of architecture, genre, government, social class, and sonic vernaculars in performance spaces that were alive with a slew of unruly forms of listening, hearing, and overhearing. If opera houses and other such buildings carefully regulated access to music and bound its distribution, many of the performance spaces discussed today were defined by sound bleeding, porosity, and iteracy. I want to emphasize briefly three aspects of these staged sound practices across the city the visual, the sonic, and the itinerant. Visually, such buildings as the Hippodrome or the Neotherm draw on a set of architectural conventions that were closer to exhibition buildings, covered markets, or railway stations than they were to the rigid and frequently classical form language of theater architecture. The, this proximity to consumer architecture allowed for a wider framework of iconographic reference and stylistic borrowings, whether the oriental arabesque of the first hippodrome or the Roman inspired glass architecture of the Neotherm gallery. From the most fairy tale of Café Concert, the Bataclan with its pagodas, to a small neighborhood pub and an open air space such as the Trianon Concert in the Grand Jardin uh, de l'Elysée Montmartre, Café Concert encompassed a wide range of built spaces within which their staged performances took place. Rather than providing restrictive, sorry, rather than proving restrictive, these architectural frameworks enabled listeners to interact with music in numerous ways. Producers, took advantage of at least some of them. One of the most characteristic sonic aspects of these performance spaces is their porosity, here's the word again, with sound bleeding both within the space and across its boundaries. Théophile Gautier's account of 12,000 people assembled in 1846 in the streets outside the Hippodrome to listen to the 1,800 musicians performing Berlioz Handel and Rossini speaks to more than simple overhearing. Rather, there are two forces at work, a political will to reach a broad audience, uh, as uh, Annelise has shown, but also a sense of sonic encroachment. I wonder how Hausmannian urbanization and sonic regimes interrelated as the city's boulevards and open, perform open air performance space. So I got myself really out of uh, my lines here. Let me start again. I wonder how Hausmannian urbanization and sonic regimes interrelated as the city's boulevards and open spaces increased. What does it mean for a neighborhood when an open air performance space or a sonically porous cafe concert moves in? Which sources will tell us how individuals respond to the pleasure of overhearing of such performances or conversely, the pain of sonic bombardment? And how did music and sounds from the neighborhood impact the performances themselves? If you think of it bi-directional. These at times rather iterant performance spaces carried a certain precariousness, however. Café Concert could be closed by the police. A sponsor of Salon Opera might move house. The first hippodrome had to make way for road building, and a theory might be better suited 
to a different theater. This sense of impermanence offers a crucial counterpoint to the narrative of state-sponsored institutional perpetuity that the histories of the Théâtre Français or the Opéra have presented. Just as sound bleeding and spatial porosity point to barely examined interactions between inhabitants and performances, these spatial shifts offer a similar sense of unregulated change. The historic sound walk of today's session opens new vistas on how these spaces, to which we might add schools and churches, among others, might have sounded across the city and its neighborhoods. And on to Claire. Thank you, Annegret. Thank you. Um, I wanted to respond in particular to Jack and Tommaso regarding the Café Concert repertoire and genre. Um, issues of multiple authorship, as well as the non-existence of stable or published texts, have sidelined the genres of féry, parody, revue, and comédie vaudeville in musicology. As Tommaso pointed out, uh, féry were constantly updated with original music, sometimes being replaced with pre-existing music, to create interesting generic flexibility between féry and vaudeville. When parody is added to this mix, the use of parodical musical materials, generally set with new words, creates further complexity with regard to the musical text and genre. A typical and successful example is La Vla Kiri, given at the Petit Casino de Paris on the 7th of October 1893, following the opera premiere of Wagner's La Valkyrie in June of the same year. While this and other parodies of Wagner's opera obviously used the music of the Ride of the Valkyries, much parodical spectacle of this era tends to mine other works for dramatic similarities in order to reuse musical materials which may have been more familiar to a Parisian middlebrow public than that of Wagner. Indeed, by the 1890s, the well-known music of the Holy Trinity of operatic composers, that is Rossini, Gounod and Bizet, is invariably used to signal the operatic, tout court, on, on popular stages. In La, uh, in La Vla Kiri, uh, Sigmund's sword Notung is quickly characterized by the couplet de sabre from Offenbach's La Grande Duchesse de Gerolstein. Wagner's second act easily transforms into a stock vaudeville domestic comedy scene, an argument between the couple Votan and Frika, here Votan and Frikas. The French version of the musical song Tarara Bomdier, which had been a huge hit for French cabaret singer Polaire in 1892, is used in this context, and the onomatopoeia of the song title extends those of the onomatopoeic calls of Wagner's Valkyries. La Vla Kiri, unusually for parodical spectacle, received a decent amount of press attention and was repeatedly referred to as a highly successful and amusing opéra bouffe. Thus, what was described as a parody of what was ironically styled a, an opéra fantastico équestre ends up being assimilated in the critical press as opéra bouffe a genre generally understood to comprise an original story and newly composed music. This for me is a clear demonstration in generic terms of the porosity we've been talking about, of how different cultural products and social populations confront one another in the urban context of popular theater to create works that escape taxonomies and scientific investigation and musicology more generally. Such works are one more complicated node in these webs of connections between high art and popular culture, between closed and open theatrical spaces in one city, and which can be fruitfully analyzed as transcultural activity, as Stephanie Schroeter has done in her work on the opera Masked Balls. Ang Harrod Kloss Stevens writer of such robust urban encounters as productive of contingent and multiple identities and social cultures. And it appears to me that we, we would be all the more richer if these repertoires, along with their performance spaces, were genuinely viewed as part of the complex matrix of musical culture, which includes those highbrow works that musicology is used to studying, but also 
a wide range of genres, works and theatres that musicology has traditionally sidelined. To give musicological voice, as it were, to a European cultural and musical heritage, which had much greater purchase in society, and I choose my term knowingly, than the arts and musics of the elites and musically educated classes. Thank you. Back to Catherine. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we've got some wonderful questions here about historical imagination, about what is contemporary experience of the city in sonic terms, um, moving across open air and closed spaces. We've got highbrow and lowbrow spaces. Um, we've got compliant and resistant spaces. Um, now, there are various ways that we can, we can think about this. We might want to think about our discussion um, in terms of cityscape and mobility, in terms of power structures, in terms of disruption and assimilation and in terms of genre and repertory, there are questions already coming in. And I thought I would start actually with the first one that's come in from Ralph Locke, which is really getting to the point of how do we communicate um, the excitement and the, the musical content of what we've all been talking about to third parties? How can we experience these different theatrical uses of music today in terms of the historical traces that are left and which are publicly available for um, thinking about giving students and cultural historians a taste of this kind of diversity that we're all talking about? Um, would somebody like to pile in? Tomasa. Uh, I'm a bit embarrassed, but uh, I guess I would have like what uh, kids today on the internet uh, call, a, call a shameless plug, uh, because I, I tried uh, with my modest means to do something like that um, for um, Naxos uh, Music Library. So I tried to uh, put together like a tour d'horizon of the very, various um, Persian theaters. So that's, that's no cafe concert. Uh, nor a hippodrome uh, in 1867, just because it's a year that is well represented uh, by famous works, and to have um, and 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 to have uh, examples with recordings that are in the Access catalog. So yeah, if anyone whose uh, institution has a subscription wants to use that as a teaching aid, I would be delighted, of course. Mark, you want to come in? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I, I was thinking sort of more base, uh, as a more, of a more basic response to, to Ralph's, Ralph's question, really. Um, and I was just thinking about just access to the music, um, you know, just how you actually find your way to these sorts of pieces. And I, I was put in mind of two things, really. One, um, uh, Richard Scher's recent edition of a Revue de Fin d'Année, which is a, you know, a, a, it's not a genre we've been talking about, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a genre that fits in very well with the discussions that we've been um, that we've been having. It's a monster thing. It's two fat volumes. Um, does serious damage to your wrist if you're not careful. Um, it's, an, it's 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 an important and impressive piece of work, and it actually responds, I think, to to some of the issues that Ralph um, Ralph is 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 raising. Um, some may know of the work that the uh, the Palazzetto Bruzzane has been doing um, under the auspices auspices of its. Um, um, it's kind of operette hat called the Bouffe Bruzane. And I'm afraid I have indulged in a little bit of willful arm twisting um, and got the Bruzane um, to at least agree in principle um, to uh, put on a, a production of a Comédie Vaudeville, um, which I think again will take us even beyond operette as a, as a kind of generic as a generic market, comedy vaudeville for those who don't, don't know is kind of it's kind of like a it's kind of like an opera except all the music is borrowed from previous previous sources. Terribly interesting because it makes reference to exactly the repertories that Sarah was talking about the you know the the high end um, uh, grand opera opera comique and so on. It's actually a way of of um, doing exactly what she suggested, which is throwing light back onto uh, opera and so on that, um, uh, that, she, that she talked about. Those are just two examples that, I, that, that, that occurred to me in, in response to, uh, to Ralph's question. Thank you, Annalise. Uh, yes, well, so I have the problem that, of course, hundreds of horses are not exactly something you can kind of rile up to represent uh, one of those reenactments. And the problem also is that there 
There is only one score that I've been able to find and that's from like 1894. So there is like these about a hundred years that we don't really know what the music was unless you like find some text, find some reviews that kind of indicate what kind of music they were performing, some stubs from that they hired military regiments, then looking at the regiments um, repertoire and all of these things. Um, but what I have found useful is actually letting students look at contemporary reenactments, both in the US, but also in, in Belgium, in the Netherlands, and, and just like have them think about like, well, just try to make them think historically about it a little bit, like try to make them look at that with historical eyes and think. And sometimes I let them actually like sing the Marseillaise when it comes up in this reenactment part. Um, and they're all, of course, extremely embarrassed to do this. Um, but in a way, it kind of gets them to feel some of the interaction that people also would have, or at least that we know from the reviews that they would join in, that they would kind of not necessarily feel that they had to stay on their place. They, sometimes I also bring like little cupcakes and lemonade or things so that it's like a bit of the experience that they get from it, which is to get them out of the kind of stuck idea that this is a normal concert experience um but yeah so yeah i don't think i there are there are any real historical documents that um yeah you can really show them but with images with contemporary examples i try to create some kind of um experience for the students i think that, you know this is the classic um case where somebody decided the archives were not worth keeping and so we spend our time trying to trying to piece together from very very fragmentary evidence some of which uh, might have have very clear uh, relationship with the sonic and some some might not i wonder if we can move on and, and just think about these questions of space and a, a question has come in um, from Jacob Ollie, um, that relates very much to Annalise to what um, what you were saying in your in your uh, larger paper, and Annegret in in your response. Um, I know everybody can see it, but very quickly to summarize the question of how Orientalism, which is so prominent in high cultural spheres in French opera, um, translates into these different social spaces. Is there perhaps, um, he says, a different sort of othering that takes place in such mixed or porous environments? I wonder if we can start with Annalise and Annegret and then work outwards from there if others want to want to come in. Shall I? By all means. Okay. Um, well, the whole othering there is very exhibitionist. It's very much a little bit like a zoo at, and much more problematic than, well, or at least straightforwardly problematic than things that happen in uh, high art. There are the Aztecs of the Hippodrome where they brought in people um, from the Americas that were also malformed and then they exhibited them. Sometimes they built little camps of uh, the Chinese and exhibited them in the Hippodrome. Um, and at the same time, you also had, um, so this was, these horse spectacles were started during the Napoleonic era and there you had Napoleon's own um, Islamic regiments that were sometimes hired to then perform there to also have that oriental aspect. Um, so, yeah, I feel like it's, yeah, it's very much a kind of exhibitionist othering, like come and look at this as a kind of like, ooh, this is new and novel and we can get money from this. Um, I don't know, Annegret probably has something to say to that too. Anna, go ahead. Sort of um, to follow up on what um, Annalise has very eloquently already presented, that there is a space for presentation of the other, and that space is generally marked. And I think that is quite important in the context of these um, institutions we, or, and, and spaces and performance environments we are talking about. And I just want to bring in uh, something I know a bit more about, and that is exhibition spaces. And if you look at some of the things like the Hippodrome or some of those absolutely wonderful architectures like the Bataclan, uh, this Orientalism is something that is othering in so many re uh, registers. Uh, the 
but it is also, if you want, a way of appropriating, trying things out and playing with architectural elements that then can be impermanent. I mean, I've been trying sort of to playing around also with the question of the itinerant and the impermanent in that exhibition buildings are meant to be for the event and then taken out with events happening, musical, sonic, and otherwise that then kind of also disappear. And they can make their way through the ears and the practice of musicians into a broader culture as with the famous Gamelon and, and, and all of the French composers in 1889. But I think there is something about, uh, again, the sense of porosity uh, that is both deeply problematic and deeply problematic in imperial contexts. And yet at the same time, also something that speaks to different ways in which space can be used, both disempowering, but at some point, perhaps even empowering. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm going out a bit on a limb, uh, a limb there, but I think it's these spaces where suddenly other sounds can also take on power. And that's just sort of something to think about. Yes, it is bounded. Yes, it is something that is always framed within the uh, context of Paris, but there's also a kind of way of thinking about it that might offer ways of resistance if I want to use this word, or at least if I go into a different direction to think about not just paranoid readings of which I'm a very great specialist, but maybe also reparative readings, which is something I'm still learning to do. Mark, I think you have... Um, thank you, yes. I mean, I guess there, there are two, two interrelated trajectories um, in play in answering this question. One, one is the kind of embodiment of the Oriental in individual works. And we're all familiar with that from Pesha de Perle, Afil African, and so on. Um, um, but also, and this is where this particular session takes us in interesting directions, is, um, um, is that the, the, the physical spaces in which both, not only those Orientalist works, but actually everything else is actually getting put on in spaces that are, are themselves architecturally orientalizing. And Gretz already pointed to the Bataclan, but the Alcazar is a very, is, is, is another example. And in fact, the more I think about um, uh, pictures I've seen of of, uh, of uh, Café Concert from the from the literature, actually, um, those kinds of orientalizing architectures are, are, are very, are very common. And then just to wrap it up, um, um, one of the examples I uh, didn't choose to talk about was a moment where um, um, uh, Operated Salon was actually mounted in the studio of a sculptor called Joseph Godier, who not only specialized in um, orientalizing sculpture, but his studio was actually an orientalizing space as well. The frustrating thing is no one actually knows what piece was actually put on in that particular in that in that in that particular space. But at least you've got the other side of the of the coin with surviving photographs from the early 1860s, 1862, I think it is, um, of these these extraordinary extraordinarily orientalizing spaces in which um, opera could be inserted, even though the um, the, um, the 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 place where that's happening um, is actually a sculptor studio. Thanks. Claire. Yes, just to take a response in a completely different direction to that question um, was, um, you know, in, in the work I've done with comic genres, of course, that that Orientalism or that or, or that alterity is neutralized in order to make um, something seem very commonplace and domestic. So, you know, the exoticness even of a Wagner opera is brought back to a very domestic Parisian situation or um, the exotic location of Salambo is, trans is transported into a, um, I don't know, you know, a, a, a very different, a very different setting. So in lots of ways, the comic genres I find tend to neutralize that alterity as a way of deriving humor.
So, um, so you've, you, you've, you've, that's a, sorry, that's a very, taking that, 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 that conversation in a very different direction, but um, that's why I, I find that a lot of the, the, the works, even those that are parodying, pad, parodying, uh, I can't even say it tonight, uh, an, an Orientalist opera end up not very Orientalist in, in, in the end. Massive. This question is really is really firing us all up. Go ahead. Yes, piggybacking on um, I guess what um, uh, Annalisa and Annegret have said, uh, and so I would say that for uh, Ferry in, in particular, um, what makes its Orientalism worse than you know in high art to 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 be uh, blunt is that um, the logic of very is attractional. So it, 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 is, it just puts uh, things and people uh, on display. Uh, so in, in a way we are closer to, to um, words fairs uh, than, 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 to, uh, than to Grand Opera in, in, in a way. And um, about um, exercising architecture, um, actually, I've, I don't know if it, this is a restorative reading, but um, I think that um, the, um, the 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 play version of Around the World in Eighty Days, um, which uh, I, I think is a very makes a comment on that in in that um, the um, the Gentleman's Club in in London. Um, that is the equivalent within the play of the fairy pal palace of a traditional fairy is um, a, an extravagant uh, Moorish revival building. And so, I mean, this seems to, to, to be a, a, an observation, if not a critique of the way um, Moorish architecture is used to, to signal uh, exclusivity and hence uh, otherworldliness. Uh, it is something that, that is abstract itself from surrounding society uh, so you know the 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 this um rich londoners are, are like the fairies of, of very i mean there's there's something very very interesting isn't there about the about the prevalence of that moorish architecture for cafe concert um everybody has an alcazar in the in the provinces everybody has an alcazar um and the other thing about the escapism of it is you know when you have them called el dorado um, so you have an Alcazar, you have an El Dorado, and somehow these two things get fused into some idea of escapist entertainment, um, as well as the exclusivity and the pretense to exclusivity that's going on. Now, there are other, um, other people, uh, Annalise, and then Jack, and then I think we'll, we'll move on to another question. I think Jack was first, so I, so I think Jack should say his. Oh, yeah, obviously building on what's been said, but also looking at Jennifer's question about uh, a dichotomy between sacred and secular and the porosity between sacred and secular spaces. And obviously her book explores this in, in great detail. Um, I'm also thinking about what uh, Céline's provocation to elude dialectics. I think a lot of our conversation is uh, structured in terms of binaries as well as a, a subject object relationship uh, in particular, this preceding conversation about Orientalism. So what we're really doing, and we've been doing this for years as musicologists, is reading. We're, we're, we're reading scores as texts, but now we're simply taking that method and we're reading buildings as texts as well, which there's nothing inherently wrong with this. But to, to think about uh, urbanism as, as a non kind of dialectical uh, approach, I think can get us out of some of these methods. And what I try to do with the Café Concert, and it kind of relates to uh, Annegret's kind of tripartite visual sonic itinerant, in particular that last one, is uh, what Henri Lefebvre calls spatial trialectics. Uh, so you, you kind of consider urban space as being constructed through three different communities. One is conceived space, which is the, the city as planned by the planner, the bird's eye view, the map, the musical score, uh, if you will, if you want to translate that into into um, into musical study, uh, and and secondly, and this is by no means hierarchical; it's really a triangle. Is perceived space, which is the space of representation. When we look at paintings or images, 
and we read those, what we're reading is obviously a reading of a reading, right? Uh, it's, it's space as interpreted by those who have some privilege to add their representation to the archive. And the archive is this other looming specter, right? What is there is what we study, right? Uh, which takes us to the third uh, aspect of the trialectic, which is the lived space. The space that for us as historical musicologists is probably the most difficult to access. And I'm thinking of Ralph's earlier question, how do we teach this in uh, absence of, be of being able to be there? And that's where we have to kind of exercise our, our, our critical imagination to, to piece together the ways in which uh, citizens of different classes accessed urban spaces and were denied access to those urban spaces. So here we're getting into ideas like Guy Debord's Derive, for example, which thinks about how our urban spaces transgressed. How do we cut against the conceived and perceived spatial uh, representation and how our space is actually um, you know, performed in, in ways that they were not meant to be performed. So uh, Marx's ideas about uh, opera de salon being this kind of privileged form of transgression. Uh, but uh, I think the Café Concert in particular, and I have an article coming out about uh, Cabaret, uh, which was exclusively a working class type of establishment. The types of songs that we don't find are the ones that for me are the most interesting because the archive is a space of privilege. Uh, it's, it's determined by what uh, Angel Rama calls the littered city or a city that is constructed out of text to be read. So we have to be conscious of the fact that if we're reading something, that means we're probably not hearing another voice. So I'll just leave it there. I think it fits in so well with what Celine was saying about um, about islands and interconnections, but also, you know, the, the, si the deafening silence of the archive. Um, what is not there is so much um, more important sometimes than what is there. And the question, this has already come up in the in the questions, and we might want to talk more about it um, towards the end. Um, Peter Mondelli says, um, this conversation highlights, highlights the need for a critical history of the various archives that we use. Um, don't get me started, Peter. I, I, I won't stop on that particular, that particular question. I'm going to suggest that we, um, unless anybody has more to say on Jennifer's, uh, Jennifer Walker's question about sacred and, and secular, is there anybody who wants to to come in with more on that. Anagret. Yeah, thank you. I was I was trying to, to mark uh, at least a little bit. I mean, if I had had more than my 500 words, I would have actually gone into, into also the hearing, overhearing and porosity of spaces that when we are thinking about entertainment and other such things, we often leave out and therefore create these kind of dichotomies, i.e. sacred spaces, whether they are churches or whether they are other uh, sacred spaces that are bound in Paris, um, uh, both inside and outside. So we get the whole thing uh, going. And if you, uh, you know better, far better than I do, Catherine, then you go into the provinces, you have processions and you have all kinds of things going on that are both spectacular and sonically present that can be overheard, that can be listened to and all of those elements. And I think um, someone, uh, I would have to go back again, um, uh, use the term, yeah, sorry, it's Fabio responding to Annalise. The term of experience, I think is very important to bring into this um, as a form of reading, also picking up on what Jack was saying. So maybe just sort of some kind of markers uh, that keeps this uh, seemingly unquestioned uh, secular, something that I would like to continue to question also, and Jennifer is the one who knows a lot more than I do, is uh, the presentation of uh, sacred or at least spiritual elements in exactly those spaces from the Café Concert to the Boulevard Theatre, etc., that we are talking about. And I think there is more to unravel and unpack and would just sort of like to sort of keep that in mind. I think that, that's such an important point, and some of it will be deeply anti-clerical, um, and some of the some of the uh, the humour will be will be exactly in, in that vein. Annalise. Um, well, and also on the kind of division between secular and sacred, when we are talking about military processions and all of the processions that kind of spilled in and out of the hippodromes, they're very strongly inspired by revolutionary. 
um, spectacles where it was always kind of mixed with sacred and some of them past churches had kind of outside services before they came to the hippodrome so there are definitely ways to kind of see those things as interconnected and spilling one into the other um, just as a brief example um, if I can um, I, I was just I was also really interested in Jack's point about the privilege of the archive but on the other hand I also think I also often think about the privilege of me as a researcher because these are um, archives that are very scattered, but as a researcher I actually can occasionally get the money to actually go to all of those various archives and try to piece the things together. So I think there is kind of double layers of privilege. On the one hand, what is preserved, but on the other hand, also our own mobility, our own possibilities of like traveling, finding out, having been trained in several languages, um, and, and actually being able to piece some of the puzzles, even however incomplete, to piece that together. Um, just as a kind of addition. And yeah, maybe we're shifting to another question, but. I'm just, um, Celine, you want to say something about sacred and secular bodies. Yes, thank you so much. Um, yes, it's uh, fascinating also what you just said. Um, and Liz, I think also that the question of the revolutionary, maybe ghost or an heritage is also the question of the, um, not just the, the venue itself, the place, you know, for spectacular performances, but the bodies themselves, are we to create bodies which might mix sacred and secular aspects and dimensions. And what I think is very interesting in what you all, um, you know, did in your papers is also like taking very seriously into consideration all, all these places. And um, thank you, Jack, for trying. I'm still processing ways we can, you know, um, challenge binarities and trialetics if in interesting things. But I think like what you did also in your papers was um, to try to understand um, new kinds also of bodies and to understand how um, we can uh, understand new forms of porosities without maybe also reproducing or producing new um, binarities. Um, so I think an interesting thing also taking a point from what uh, Sarah said was about um, understanding better, you know, the big islands from these ones. But I think it would be like an act of predation as well, because it would be also just, you know, focusing on minorities to better understand uh, big islands. I think it's also like um, a risk, but to go back to the question of, uh, of um, sacred and secular, I think it's very important what you did was not just focus on the commercial aspects. So I think like one of the reasons why we uh, tend to create all these binarities as well is sometimes we think that um, if it's commercial, it's maybe less authentic. So it's interesting also to understand better the question of uh, sacred or orientalism. Um, you know, in my research on the venues of the Aisawa Brotherhood, for example, um, the question was not to neutralize entirely the, the power of these uh, venues or to annihilate. They were um, seriously trying to recreate it in the exhibitions or when they were going there um, in Algeria or in Morocco, they were really trying to feel the thrill of, of it, you know. So the idea of, of feeling um, the taste of, of, of this kind of diversity, as you said, uh, Catherine, is a, a very serious one. It's not just uh, commercial, it's not just entertainment, it's just, and you know, the same for the ferry, are, are we to travel to these spaces with our bodies and to um, observe, not just to create new sensations, but to observe our own sensations, um, I, I say are, oh, but I'm talking about these people, <laughs> are we sure? So I think the archive is also for us like this um, uh, traveling experience, and I stopped there. I think that's a wonderful segue actually into, into the question that Mark put, which takes us towards genre and power relations. Um, we, and you were talking about hierarchies, etc. cetera. Um, and um, I mean, Mark, you can, you can formulate your own question, but it, I, I think, you know, we had um, talked in, in uh, a prior session about highbrow, lowbrow, middlebrow, and the extent to which these might or might not be um, useful within within um, thinking about about France, but you know you're asking about how we do an injustice to certain genres. Um, I'm going to leave it to you to pose your question. 
sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, actually, just picking up the, the the tail end of the previous conversation to 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 make sense of this. I mean, one of the one of one of one of the ways that one might try and characterize this entire field of study, right? Because that's really what we're talking about. We're, we're, talk we're talking about um, um, uh, uh, not just a generic field, but actually a whole set of behaviors, practices um, that are radically different to the, the conventional view from the from the opera box at the Academy Royale de Musique or the Théâtre Italien or, or, or whatever. And I was actually just thinking about rather than sacred and secular, actually ritualized and non-ritualized. Um, because one of the things that seems to characterize all the, um, all the genre we've been talking about and their contexts is how they are entirely non-ritualized. If you set them alongside the very heavily ritualized um, events at the uh, the opera or even the or, or even the opera comique. Think about you know the, just the convention of um, uh, of having a ballet at the opera, for example. That's something that has to, has to happen. Um, it's and, and that's effectively a, a it's 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 a ritual. It's more than a convention. And um, and what we have in in all these all all these genres in 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 fairy, in parody in comedy vaudeville revue de fin de, de, de fin d'année everything at the cafe the cafe concert um, is 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 to turn its back on that kind of um, ritualized activity and and to open up a whole bunch of much wider. Um, Non, non ritualized practices. Um, and so looking back at what I wrote, which I did at, at speed and while I was trying to listen to Claire at the same time, it looks horrible because it's all, all about super gene generic groupings, which all seems terribly kind of um, um, uh, sort of typological. And that was absolutely not what I was what I was what I was getting at. Um, but um, I, 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 who was it? Was it? Um, it was Thomas, or wasn't it? Who was talking about um, erasure, and absolutely all this stuff has been erased from any kind of musicological consciousness, notwithstanding the the cover of the Norton, uh, the Nort the Norton Norton history. But when you said that, I was actually thinking, well, in fact, is this actually true of most of nineteenth century France? I mean, it's basically erased. I mean, you know, to try and get Maya Beer even onto a um, onto a onto a platform alongside Verdi and Wagner is a is a is a is a major undertaking. So I, I kind of I, I kind of recognize that there were sort of various levels of erasure there, and what we're dealing with here is absolutely erased out of sight. And then that feeds right into what um, uh, Annalise was saying about. Uh, about the the sources that you actually have for these um, these events that we're trying to uh, we're trying to we're trying to understand, and um, and I guess in response to 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 Peter's question about the um, the archive, and and a kind of uh, a kind of history or a genealogy of the archives, uh, some of which is very straightforward. Think about the censor, for example. That's a you know one that that takes nanoseconds to think through. But many of the others um, are, are are really much more complicated, I think, um, and uh, um, and in many cases so fragmentary, as in Annalise's case. And I'm thinking of a lot of a lot of operettes uh, and a lot of comedie vaudeville where we have almost nothing. Um, apart from just simply a, a recognition that the, that the event took took uh, uh, took place, I um, mean, yeah, it's trying to get around erasure seems like a, a, an almost an insurmountable um, obstacle. Annegret, uh, to pick up on erasure, I think uh, is probably a very fruitful way to think about musical practice of the past. Um, when we are thinking of archives, I often think of the introductory chapter of um, Anna Maria Ochoa Gautier's uh, book about orality and how archives can become palimpsests that can then lead to other ways of um, at least approaching or thinking about past musical practices. 
are these archives going to allow us to put on a uh, re uh, what, do, what do we call it restaging of of a hippodrome um, event with however many horses probably not are the archives going to uh, give us ways to think about the past and think about who is participating be conscious about the violence done through archival processes i think while this might seem like a very negative strategy, it's actually a strategy that can recover quite a bit. And I think it's something we have started doing, that we have started doing thinking about, you know, how does sound travel? I want to really get back to that for a moment. How do sounds travel and how can we recover these, these presences of sounds that now are absolutely absent and they're absent in any Wagner score as much as they're absent in any text that describes what's going on in the Hippodrome. And maybe that is a way into these very complex, but also very vital and exciting forms of musical practice and experience. One of the things that I was quite struck by, and I said it briefly in my response is, you know, we, we are assuming this is great, sound bleeding is great, right? Just, people can access, we have all this democracy stuff going on. But frankly, if I'm sitting in a room and someone next door is making a lot of noise, that can be really quite annoying as the person who has to listen or overhear this. On the other hand, so it, uh, if you're thinking bigger, you have the hippodrome creating a lot of sound, but what happens if you want to perform, if you want to even do a operette de salon or opera de salon, and you get all the noise. So, so, so this kind of thinking how noise circulates, and I think it's something we might think about with respect to Hausmann. And Jackie were talking about the kind of cleaning up. And I'm wondering if, we could also think about whether Hausmann's Hausmann either intentionally or just by additional volume managed to clean up the soundscape of Paris by actually limiting sound bleedings, channeling them. Grand boulevards create very different soundscapes than very narrow streets, etc. So I have sort of moved us a little bit around, but uh, sort of just some thoughts in response to um, both Jack and Mark. Yeah, okay. I, I think that raises broader questions, perhaps beyond the scope of this this roundtable about uh, noise versus silence and 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 intentional sound versus unintentional sound. Uh, I, th I think Osman's uh, intention was to kind of control sensory experience as as much as possible and to compartmentalize. So. Uh, not just in terms of the visual vista, but also in terms of, you know, monumental sound being monumental and overwhelming and could even use the word sublime, but it's a very controlled type of experience as opposed to the spontaneity um, and un unpredictability of, of a place like the Café Concert. And I, I, I think that the question of not was there sound or were they listening, uh, I, I think more uh, appropriately, for whom was the sound produced and, and who had the privilege of listening and for whom was the particular sound, sound or noise is, is, more, is more fruitful, I think. And uh, obviously like Jacques Attali's book, Noise comes to mind here. And what I found interesting about, about his book is that he's actually quite disparaging of the Café Concert because for him, it's kind of the, the, the birth of the musical commodity. Uh, and I, I, I kind of push against that a little bit. Uh, in thinking of the, the communities for whom that mode of urbanism was going back to this word micro, a microcosm of uh, where you are not, not just a spectator in an urban environment, but you are a user of an urban environment. And I think that was something that ran directly counter to Osmanization as an aesthetic concept where um, urbanism was a form of spectacle, where uh, there was a form of sensory control over you know, everything from where the cemetery was located uh, and it was pushed into the peripheries at this point to um, Léa Central being built. So all of the smells and the stench of the fish was centralized as opposed to decentralized. So there are these different acts of sensory experience which kind of tie what we are doing today with some of the sensory historians of the 90s like Alan Corbin or, or Bruce Smith and his book, um, The Acoustic World of Early Modern England. Uh, who's, whose hand was up? It was Sarah and then Mark and then um, Shana has a has a question that I want to get to. So Sarah first. and Annalise. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, 
yes, going back to this idea of porosity of sound um, from what Anna Gret was saying and Jack just now as well. Um, I just wonder as well whether um, this is also a way to help us out of this sort of the binary, the, the, sort of di the dialectic um, that so often in what we're talking about, it's about the sort of interactions and the sort of the thresholds between between um, these two fields. So whether we're talking about sound, whether we're talking about genre, whether we're um, talking about social social class. And it seems to me that these kinds of genres that we've been talking about are um, really really good and um, productive ways of thinking about um, how everything comes together um, and interacts at, at a point rather than thinking of the sort of the, the either or. Um, it's more a comment than anything. Who was, who was, who was next? Was it Annalise? Annalise and then Mark. Oh, well, I, th I think my question is that I'll, I'll be brief. Um, I think what, what's also really interesting is thinking about the sound qualities, because we always, I, I also, if I imagine things, you often imagine them the way that we are really used to, but also, um, and then how they're described, it's, it's very difficult to actually get to the sound like they were singing in the Café Cancer or like they were playing in the Hippodrome. Um, and, and often there, there is also imaginations of the reviewers, of those that write about it, and then the actual reality. Like um, I mentioned in my paper that there was this performance by 1800 musicians, and then they were very confused because it wasn't the musicians like, or, or the Hippodrome falling down like the walls of Jericho. Um, but I think in, at the same time, it's also like, how do these spaces sound with the the music and all of the noise? Um, they, they actually at one point had to rebuild parts of the Hippodrome because it had like just fallen down during a performance. And it's unclear whether or not it was like weight or resonance that actually did this. Um, so, so yeah, I think there is much more to sound than just thinking about noise and sound and sound inside and outside, um, just to add uh, a little more complexity to what has already been very complexified. Um, Mark. Thank you. I, I just want to go back to Jack's idea of the of the of the of the cafe concert kind of subverting the the house the Osmanian disciplining of the of the of the of the city and its um, um and its and its sounds and it's certainly true that one of the the principal things that Usman did was he took all these theatres that were absolutely side by side on the Boulevard du Temple right um and broke that up completely if you if you if you look at the um at the position in 1855 um, and then the position in 18, 1865, that that cheek by jowl quality of all those theatres has completely disappeared. You know, the, the Teatro Lyrique is taken right down to the Chatelet. I mean, it's it, that's a that's an enormous it's an enormous jump, and um, uh, and it, it made me wonder what, what what the Boulevard du Temple actually felt like. Um, particularly in spring and summer, where you're presume you're presumably opening every conceivable um, um, door and window to actually make um, make the place reasonably habitable, um, and and to the degree to which those those buildings are actually sonically discreet, um, and I would I would love to know. Um, I would love I'd love to know more about more about that. I mean, the thing about the Café Concert is is that they're nothing like that, right? They're scattered all over the city pretty well. Um, and um, um, and kind of, you know, you know, there's, a, there's obviously a prehistory pre pre Usman, but um, they kind of slot in um, uh, sort of after the after the event in ways that are really rather interesting. And I suppose I just to conclude by stating the blindingly obvious which is that the cafe the cafe concert um, um, the the auditorium is designed to allow sonic bleed through into the other parts into the galleries where you're actually eating and drinking that's 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 part of the uh, part of the point in a way that a conventional theater um, at least in principle the um, the 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 auditorium contains the theatrical and musical event and the foyer even the coulisses do do, do different kind of social and cultural work i think that's really interesting and oh, celine go ahead 
No, just a quick um, observation. I think it's interesting because this idea that um, Osman erased, uh, yeah, of course he erased, but we have many examples of, of cases of erasure throughout the 19th century or also of uh, displacements. Now think about the Théâtre Italien being displaced from one place to the other and then to another one, etc. cetera, um, or um, a theater being destroyed by fire and then rebuilt. I think it's more the systematicity of, of, of course, of what Osman said, but also of, of what he did, but also about the, what was for him a hard work you know, was this operation of erasure was not just something um, like destruction, it was a creation, of course, for him. Now, I was just coming back to your idea also to trying to challenge the idea that there would be the ritual and the non-ritual. I think like lots of anthropologists, of course, would say that the non-ritualist practices are, of course, ritualized, right? And that the um, apparent, um, apparent um, non-ritual practices at the Café Concert are of course also uh, well thought in the way they can disrupt uh, the usual convention. So I was wondering if, um, um, I, I would not use personally the word uh, rituals, but I think it's interesting because then it, it allows us to think maybe differently about the question itself of subversion or of convention. Mark, quickly. Yeah, can I just come, back, come out very quickly for that? Because I, I'm, I'm not sure I express myself very, very clearly. I mean, what I was interested in was the, the variety of activities that are scattered across these, um, what, what I was calling non-ritual non, non environments. And obviously, Celine is dead right. They create their own, their, their, own, their, 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 their own rituals, their own conventions, and they do that. And they do that very quickly. I think my point is that they're actually very different right you know at the um at at various um various theaters both the ones that stayed on the boulevard du temple and others that were uh, others that were moved certainly in the cafe concert i think the 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 way you um the way you experience um song and after 1868 drama um at the alcazar um or the el dorado or the casino um, is, is actually is actually very different, and that's a that's a, a, a history that's actually you know yet to be written. I mean, it's it's um, it, you know it's it's obviously barely in its in its infancy. I think this question of Osman and 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 Celine, what you were saying about purging um, that you know that purging the toxicity um, of the body is really interesting, and, and you know we see so many pictures of um, Paris having been cleaned up and forget how much rubble there was during that process. This is not an event, it is a process and it goes on for a very, very long time. So Parisians' experience is, is, is very messy. But I was just thinking as we were talking, you know, what, what might constitute a, a genre that expresses that idea of sort of control and sanitization, but at the same time, the bleed through and the monumentality. And I'm thinking about the bandstand in the park and um, you know, military musicians or, or fanfare um, who are, you know, in, in uniforms, they're encaged in their bandstand, they're encaged in a park that is, is itself an ordering of nature. Um, and, you know, at the same time, they're playing extracts of supposedly popular the theatrical music and the question of how much bleed through there is between those national theatres and what we're talking about seems to me to be something that we could perhaps look into more but before we stop let's have a look quickly at, at Shana's um, question about going back to where we sit um, monumentality and musicology's values and the work concept con um, monumentalizing whatever can be considered works and marginalizing what can't um, and she asks you know what does this forgotten repertoire tell us about authorship and questions for authorship now Tommaso you you address this one head on so I'm going to suggest that that for two minutes we we let you loose on this particular question well, it's, it's, it's actually a very short answer. I mean, the, the word concept does not uh, apply for, at least for Ferry. Um, it, the, those, um, those plays are flexible. They, they are not, uh, you know, they, they don't have a stable text. They are collaborative and, and uh, the, um, the, the, the contingencies of, of uh, of the production have so much uh, a, an impact on on the on the finished work that even even the um, even the, the the 
the, the process of making a ferry because the, 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 that, that's where they use um, is, is completely different, I don't know, from, from, from the literary theater where, you know, the author would come to the theater with a manuscript and, and in case of ferry, they, they would be commissioned um, from the, the, the manager. And then probably I think during uh, the drafting phase, they were uh, already liaising with the, the, the head um, the stitch carpenter uh, in order to figure out the tricks. So yeah, we, it, it, it's really as, as removed as possible from you know, the, the Meyerbarian or Wagnerian uh, idea of a state work where you know, authority, uh, um, authorship is centralized uh, and you know, everything is, is stable. Annalise, a quick coda to that. Um, yes, well, I wanted to kind of tie it back also to Fabio's question about experience. Of course, these kind of documents that we have, they don't allow us to tell the same stories that we can tell about an operatic score. So I think that's what made me, I find it at the same time very frightening, but at the same time also really interesting to be more creative and more thinking about these, these ideas as experiences and not as like, oh, this is a work we can really pin down what this was. Thank you. We are out of time. We could keep continuing to talk about this for ages. I had a list of questions and I think I've got through three out of 13 or something. Um, thank you to the audience for wonderful questions, um, which really sparked off a lot of discussion. Um, thank you to our position paper um, givers. Thank you to our respondents. 